The sclera, that outer uh, white portion, its job is to uh, support and protect the eye. Uh, the uvea, just beneath it, the vascular uh, layer of the eye. Um, this is where we get the blood supply, we get lymphatics, uh, the delivery of oxygen, nutrients, waste. Uh, it's also going to help regulate the amount of light coming into the eye by uh, contracting or dilating the pupil with the pupillary dilator or uh, constrictor muscles. Um, it secretes and then resorbs any of uh, the humors, either uh, the aqueous humor and it helps maintain the vitreous humor. And, and then it also controls the uh, shape of the lens uh, through the action of the ciliary body, uh, which I, I touched on briefly in lab and we'll talk about more in a moment. So the pupillary muscles. These are the muscles that are um, invested uh, in the iris. We have two of them, the pupillary dilator muscles and the pupillary constrictor muscles. So the pupillary, uh, pupillary dilator muscles are ones that are all radiating out and they contract and they pull that opening open. All right, and then the pupillary constrictor muscles uh, constrict and pull the hole uh, closer together, much like the orbicularis oculi uh, contract and close off the eye, or like the drawstrings on a little uh, bag uh, might. Um, so when, when light uh, comes, increases over here, we have a sympathetic uh, stimulation of uh, the pupillary dilators. And then when there is parasympathetic stimulation, uh, the pupillary constrictors uh, contract. Okay? And we talked a little bit about how sympathetic is uh, fight or flight and parasympathetic is rest and digest. Uh, and this may seem to be contrary to what you might think. Um, why is parasympathetic uh, coming on when there's a lot of light when you rest at night, not in the daytime? Um, actually, the, the sympathetic stimulation, the rationale would be that, uh, say you are in a, in a fight or you're, you're excited for some reason, uh, you want more light to come into the eye to be able to give uh, you the optimal um, exposure, the optimal ability to see. So... Uh, but they're not just like switches either. Uh, you could have conflicting or overlapping responses. Um, so intraocular pressure is uh, the pressure of the fluid pressure inside the eye. Um, that fluid pressure um, is controlled by the choroid. Uh, uh, it produces the aqueous humor. Uh, it gets produced by the ciliary body. It uh, comes through the, the posterior chamber into the anterior chamber and gets resorbed by the uh, scleral venous sinus of Schlem. Poor guy, he got his name on something. Okay. Um, and helps the eye retain its shape. So there is... Uh, Pathology related to this, does anybody wear contacts or go to the optometrist or even the opth ophthalmologist? You've probably had your eye pressure checked. Uh, used to be they would stick this thing right on your eyeball and do it. I don't think they do that anymore. They, now they like puff air at your eyeball, correct? Or do they still stick something on your eye? Yeah, well, some people do. Uh, you've, you were shaking your head. Yeah, sometimes the, the newer... Uh, modes of doing it, uh, just like blow air at your eye and, and measure the response. Um, but uh, they're checking for glaucoma. Glaucoma is a uh, disorder where you have increased ex uh, intraocular pressure either due to increased production uh, by the choroid or decreased resorption into the canal of Schlem. And the problem here is that intraocular pressure, when it goes really high, it it's uh, the, the blood that's coming into the back of the eye through the retinal artery has to fight against 
that intraocular pressure to bring blood in. And when you have a high intraocular pressure, uh, you can actually restrict blood flow uh, into the eye, and the retina begins to die uh, back and uh, can lead to irreversible blindness. So glaucoma is a very uh, serious disease that you wouldn't know was the only way to know it's there is by looking at the, uh, the intraocular, intraocular pressure. It's easily treated with uh, drops now. Okay, so the vitreous body uh, behind the aqueous body is this jelly mass that uh, I talked about in lab. So here uh, is an isolated vitreous body. It's um, giving the eye its shape and supporting the retina, keeping the retina kind of up onto the wall, the back wall of the eye. It's mostly water, mostly water, a, little, a few electrolytes, uh, such as salt and sugar, some, a protein called vitrocine, uh, and the type 2 collagen. It's, it's a collagen isotype, uh, as well as a polymeric chain of some carbohydrates called hyaluronic, <coughs> hyaluronic acid. Is that? Yeah, oh yeah, there it is. So here is uh, the uronic, uronic acid. This is an N-acetyl uh, side chain, uh, and this dimer, of uh, glucuronic acid and N-acetyl uh, glucosamine are uh, in a beta 1, uh, 3 linked, and then you have a repeating, uh, a repeating polymer of that in the eye, helping to keep it hydrated. The lens itself, these are uh, five. Fibro, uh, fiber cells that have no nuclei or organelles. The nuclei and the organelles are degraded as the cells uh, mature. They are packed with these proteins called crystalline. Um, and the crystalline has unique optical properties when properly hydrated that uh, allow the lens to um, be clear and have a focusing power. Um, so here we have a, a scanning electron micrograph of a lens held in place by these suspensory ligaments that are embedded uh, into the ciliary process of the ciliary body. Pretty cool. Um, it is these crystallines that uh, get UV damaged um, and uh, begin to crosslink and form this. Uh, so UV causes a crosslinking of these proteins. And they lose their optical, uh, their optical uh, translucency and their optical properties. So on the left-hand side, his pupil looks red. This guy's been dilated. He's, they've stuck a bunch of uh, drops in his eye, dilated his eye. And on, on the left, his eye is red. That may be the more unsettling one to you, but actually that's normal. You're, that redness is the back of his retina that you're seeing there through the lens. Uh, and on the right, he's got this milk eye, and that is simply the lens that has uh, been damaged by UV. This is called, does anyone know what that's called? What is that called? What is that, that cloudy thing in his eye? No one's ever, is that? A, a cataract, yeah, cataract. Uh, and cataract just means... Um, Cataract just means waterfall. And so it's as if a waterfall has fallen over your, your vision. Well, I should have said this too, Iris. This is a fun one. Iris, is, uh, Iris was a Greek goddess who was a sort of a, a messenger, uh, not a messenger of God, but she, she was like a, um, I don't know, what's the word? She would, would bring people along. She was like a, sort of like the taxi driver, I suppose, of the gods. And she rode on a rainbow. So iris refers to rainbow. That's why the colored part of your eye is called an iris. All right. Just to, I'm not going to go through all this anatomy. We sort of already did. Uh, but I, just to reorient you, uh, light comes in along that visual axis, goes through the cornea, which has some slight optical refractivity and does add a little bit to the focusing power uh, of the lens. All right. So, for example, when has anyone here had RK, uh, LASIK? What else do they call it? Radiokeratotomy? Where they, they, you guys are too young for it yet. But in your late 20s, those of you who have cat, uh, 
contacts and don't want them can get uh, some laser etching in your cornea and uh, it's like permanent lenses uh, there. So the cornea helps the lens focus the light then onto the uh, back of the retina um, where uh, the photoreceptors pick up that light. So I use this word refraction. What does that word mean? Well, it is simply the bending of light as light passes from one medium into another that have two different uh, optical, what's called refractivities or optical densities. They have different properties. Uh, the light moves at different speeds within those two, uh, those two opposing mediums. And here we have light passing through air uh, into the lens. And uh, the light is bent by uh, the lens. All right, so this is called refraction, and this is how a lens is able to focus, uh, is, is able to focus um, the light coming into the eye. So we have this notion of a focal distance. There's light uh, from a distant source that, ha that is focused at one uh, point, which the focal distance is the midpoint of the lens. Uh, to the point where it's actually focused. And then if you bring something closer to the lens, a close source where the, the rays of light are divergent and not parallel, then uh, the focal point uh, is a little bit further away uh, from uh, the lens, and there's a longer focal distance. All right, so the concept of focal distance. Um, the rounder the lens, the shorter the focal distance. So in panel B, we have a close source and a longer focal distance with a flatter lens. And we round that lens out, and it puts more bending power onto uh, that light, and we shorten the focal distance. All right. So this is how, by changing the shape of the lens, this is how we're able to bring distant things into focus versus near things into focus. Okay. Uh, when you look at your hand, and then you look at a mountain, and for the briefest moment, the mountain's not in focus, then it becomes it comes into focus. Uh, this is due to the changing of the shape of, of the lens. It's called accommodation. We'll get to it in a moment. There's another optical property here. It's the notion of inversion. Uh, so as light uh, in the in the top panel of A and C there, you see uh, the the light coming in from from above gets focused, uh, gets cast onto the uh, back lower portion of the eye, and something from low down gets uh, cast into the upper uh, portion, the superior aspect of the retina, uh, so that the light that is coming into the back of your eye from me is casting an image of me onto the back wall of the retina, but upside down. Well, the reason you don't see me as upside down, it should be obvious to you. Your brain just takes that information in and flips it and inverts it, right? Uh, and so there's a side-to-side -side inversion as well. Uh, accommodation, I, I described essentially the physics of that the last slide. It's simply the changing of the shape of the lens uh, to bring whatever image you're looking at into focus on the retina. Uh, be it near or far, uh, we, we change the shape of the lens. So, uh, but what, what's important here is the ciliary muscle is, for close vision, um, the ciliary muscle is contracted. That muscle is contracted when you're looking at things close up, and the lens is rounded. The ciliary muscle is not pulling on the lens. In fact, it is relieving tension on the lens by increasing tension on the sclera and bringing that outer fibrous tunic uh, a little bit closer. It's just drawing, just putting a little bit of tension on that uh, fibrous tunic and bringing the eye, uh, that opening of the eye, just a little bit rounder, relieving tension on the suspensory ligaments and letting that, that lens balloon out to where it, it would like to be uh, 
if there were no tension on it. Then the ciliary muscle relaxes, the, the sclera opens up, because it's, it's got the natural fibrous tendency to, to come open like this, stretching on the, uh, as so doing, stretching on the suspensory ligaments and then flattening that lens out, all right, and enabling you to look at things in the distance. Uh, there's tension being applied to the lens by the sclera uh, because we've released the ciliary muscle. That ciliary muscle is under the control of autonomics that uh, have uh, a uh, ganglionic synapse in the ciliary ganglion behind the eye, fibers coming along the oculomotor nerve, uh, as well as the trochlear nerve, I believe. Uh, is it the trochlear? I think so. Um, <clears throat> we talked about that yesterday. So that's accommodation, kind of a, a, an unusual, unusual mechanics, uh, contrary to what your intuition may be. Is anyone in the class astigmatic? Yeah, yeah. You've got contacts in right now? Yeah. So uh, astigmatism is a condition where uh, the shape of the cornea is not perfectly round, okay? So there's some anomaly in the shape of that cornea. Uh, person, does anybody here have uncorrected vision? Uh, Tanner, do you wear contacts? No. So when you look at that, uh, do all of these numbers look evenly spaced to you? Yeah. yeah. Um, Amanda in the back, if she were to remove her contacts, I don't know how severely astigmatic you are, but a person who uh, is astigmatic, when they look at that, uh, maybe 10 and 11 look closer together than 2 and 3, and they may look further apart. So there's going to be some distortion in the spacing about that. You know, you're looking at the center. You'd be looking at the center of that circle, and you'd, you'd be seeing uh, some distortions in the, in the spacing. Someone with really, really astigmatic vision uh, would, would look at a person and, for example, see some kind of really... Uh, distorted, warped uh, vision, but that would be pretty, pretty severe, I would guess. Can lead to uh, headaches, uh, et cetera. So uh, normal vision, a person with unimpaired vision uh, would be called emotropic, uh, emotropia. <clears throat> this is somebody with no problems in their vision. And then astigmatic is a, ver a person with a problem in their cornea. All right. The concept of visual acuity. Visual acuity. Uh, the visual acuity is how well you are able to uh, focus on something that uh, arbitrarily is 20 feet away. So we call normal is what every other emotropic person can see at 20 feet is what you can see at 20 feet, all right? And we express that as 20-20. Uh, so uh, what, what an average emotropic person sees at 20, you see at 20. If um, you are, uh, if you have uh, impaired vision, maybe you're 20-40, uh, maybe you're 20 50. Uh, so you see at 20 feet uh, what an, uh, an emotropic person might see at, uh, at 40 feet. All right. You have to be 20 feet to be able to see that. Um, here are some different uh, problems with your visual acuity. You can have myopia uh, or nearsightedness. Um, that means you have a hard time uh, visualizing things that are far away, uh, and they use a diverging lens. They use a diverging lens. So uh, in a myopic, an uncorrected myopic person in panel B, the focal point is in front of that retina, making uh, anything uh, far away look blurry. You put a diverging lens on it, and it throws that focal point back onto the fovea uh, for clear vision. On the other hand, there are people who are hyper- Opic, hyperopic. Uh, these are far-sighted people. They can see things very clearly close up, uh, but they have a hard time uh, 
uh, seeing things far away. Um, and they use a converging lens. So in hyperopia, the focal point is behind the retina, and a uh, converging lens brings it forward. Uh, this can be a contact. This can be uh, glasses. In older people, their ability, uh, <clears throat> their ability to accommodate goes down as their um, lens becomes less elastic. Their lens doesn't stretch the way it used to. And uh, they become hyperopic. Uh, the hyperopia in elderly people, because of a loss of elasticity, is called presbyopia. Are there any Presbyterians in the, in the class? No? Well, a presbyter is an elder, a church elder. It just means old. So presbyopia is old vision. Okay. All right. Um, here's the retina. Uh, picture of the retina. And we see uh, this bright white spot in the middle. This is the optic disc. Uh, and then we see the retinal artery uh, radiating, uh, sending its branches out around this other point to the left called the fovea. Um, the fovea is the center of your field of vision. All right, this is where uh, the the rods are the most, or uh, the cones, I'm sorry, are the most concentrated, and this is going to be the the uh, highest visual acuity. The area right around that uh, fovea is called the macula, and this and it's actually the macula that is uh, full of these of these cones, and the fovea is the little depression uh, in the back of the eye, right there. Um, so this optic disc is uh, the site of your blind spot. Um, right here, uh, I, I'm showing a picture of uh, a doctor's coat with a, uh, with a red pin sticking in the lapel. Uh, a neuro-ophthalmologist, or any really good ophthalmologist, uh, may come into the consult suite with one of these red pins in their lapel. And the reason uh, that's there is they can do a very uh, rough and ready, uh, quick assessment of a person's field of view. What is a field of view? So uh, if you close one eye and you're looking out, um, in, that, in that 180 degree hemisphere in which you can see with that eye, um, are there any regions that have scotomas, places where the retina is not working and it's just a blurry spot? Uh, you can map out uh, scotomas, they're called scotomas, in a person's field of view very rapidly by having the person uh, standing a few feet from them, having them look at the bridge of your nose and staying there and telling and you telling them, or them telling you with one of their eyes closed, uh, them telling you when they can and cannot see the red tip of uh, that, uh, of that uh, pin. You can play this game with yourself. It's pretty cool. You get yourself uh, the uh, little pin or any kind of thing that has a little uh, colored bit on it. And uh, pins work very well. And you can close one eye and hold it out about 23 degrees lateral uh, to the, your center of vision. And you can actually uh, park that pin right over uh, right in the path of the light that would be falling onto the optic disc, and it will just magically disappear. Everyone, even with normal vision. Uh, so that, that's something fun for you to do later. Uh, this is another way to do it. Uh, it may be hard in your seat, uh, but you close your eye and look at, uh, if you're like properly lined up with the screen, you close your eye and look at the cross, and then um, if you are in the right alignment, you should be able to get that dot to disappear because um, it'll be sitting on top of your uh, blind spot. All right? So maybe not. If you're off to the side or you're too far away or whatever, it, it may not work for you. But um, All right. <clears throat> the disc. Now, 
ophthalmology, and in particular neuro-ophthalmology, is a really fascinating discipline. Because, and I, I'm going to sing the praises of this discipline uh, right now. Because the optic nerve is the only nerve in the body that you can visualize with your naked eye from outside the body. All right? It's the only nerve you can actually look at. More than that, it reports on so much. The eyes themselves are an amazing diagnostic tool uh, for pointing out different types of pathology. So, uh, for example, here, we have, um, well, before I get into talking about the pathology, we see in the top there uh, some, some two, two patients having their uh, retinas inspected by ophthalmoscopes. If you ever find yourself in a seat having somebody inspect you with an ophthalmoscope, um, and if they're doing it from way back here, get out of that chair and get out of that room because they're turkeys. Uh, to really be able, maybe they can see a flash of red back there, but they're not seeing anything worthwhile. They're wasting their time and your time. If someone's actually going to, and it's very common, what you see in the right there with that guy trying to look in from way back here, it's, it's pretty common uh, for novices, but it's, it's a total, it's for show, it's a waste of, of uh, that patient's time. They're not really able to glean anything. To really get a good look at the retina, you gotta get, right, I'm gonna invade your space. You gotta get right up on a person uh, with that uh, ophthalmoscope and look right into the back of their eye, okay? Uh, so don't be shy about it if you're ever in that case uh, with a, an ophthalmoscope in your hand looking into the back of somebody's eye. Uh, and you've got to move all around to really inspect that back surface of the retina to, to see if there's lesions back there, to see uh, what there is. The most important thing to look at is the optic disc. And you want to know, so here's an, a nice healthy optic nerve, all right? Uh, here's an optic nerve in glaucoma. High intraocular pressure. That uh, the, too much aqueous humor pressing on the uh, retinal artery, occluding uh, blood from the retina. And you can look, see these projectors are so crappy. I, it looks good on my thing here, but uh, we can see nice healthy tissue. Here it's starting to begin to look speckled, right? That tissue looks speckled and distressed. Those uh, arteries are not perfused. There is cupping and, uh, no, I'm sorry, there, there's uh, bleaching in the optic disc. That's an unhealthy uh, optic nerve. This person has glaucoma. You can, you can diagnose so many other types of pathology. Uh, so for example, here, here's an optic disc with real cupping, that optic nerve, that optic disc becomes uh, a cup. It's like a little hill, and it's ballooning out. That's telling you that that person has a tumor inside their brain. They have a brain tumor that is pressing uh, that optic nerve forward. All right. So without any scans, without any kind of radiology, just by knowing what you're looking at, by looking in the eye, you can tell a whole host of uh, pathology. So multiple sclerosis, sclerosis shows up uh, in the optic uh, disc. Neuromyelitis optica, which can be an indication of um, uh, autoimmune disorders. Various infections, if you have some kind of sepsis that, that can show up in the optic uh, disc. Cranial arteritis uh, of, of any sort. Uh, uh, if the person has problem with drugs, or uh, tumors, uh, if they've been undergoing radiation therapy. All of these different uh, conditions will show up upon close uh, informed inspection of the optic disc. So uh, it, it is a skill, a, a clinical diagnostic skill well worth honing. So modern visualization methods uh, involve this high-definition optical coherence tomography. Pretty sweet stuff. Uh, they will, um, this was, this is the back of uh, my eyeball. So last summer, I had uh, a vitreal detachment from my retina. The vitreous detached 
from the back of my retina, and I had these weird black uh, swimmy things in my vision, uh, which eventually, they're floaters, uh, which eventually resolved themselves. And I went to go see a doc down um, in, in uh, Boston who is, was excellent, excellent physician. And this is uh, the picture that they took of the back of my eye with this, uh, they just shine lasers in there and uh, get a, uh, a uh, three-dimensional picture of uh, the back of the eye. So here in this panel, you can see the fovea. Uh, this would all be macula right there. It looks pretty good. Uh, here is uh, my, my disc, I guess, which is, which is healthy looking. The back of my eye was fine. <clears throat> I just bumped my head in a pool. Uh, all right, so on to the rods and the cones. There are two types of photoreceptors in the eye, rods and cones. Rods are uh, highly sensitive to light. It doesn't take very much light to turn them on. They are used for what is called scotopic vision. Scotopic vision is low light vision, night vision, black and white vision. Okay? High contrast, black and white, in the dark, nighttime vision. That is the rods, scotopic vision. Very sensitive, very sensitive. Cones are, and there's different flavors of cones uh, that are going to give us sensitivity to different colors. That's how we see color. They are less sensitive to light. They are densely packed into the macula, and the fovea in the eye. These, because they're so densely packed, uh, they're giving us a high resolution, high resolution. So rods uh, give us low resolution, but they're highly sensitive to low light. Uh, cones give us high resolution, but they're minimally sensitive in low light. All right, so it's a trade-off. We'll talk about it more. Um, just the basic anatomy of a rod and a cone. Uh, there's, there's basically four regions. There's the outer segment, which is where uh, the actual photoreception happens. There's an inner segment, uh, which is where metabolic activity is going on. There's the cell body where the nucleus is. And then there's the axonal uh, projection with the synaptic uh, vesicles at the end. All right. Okay, so in a cone, the discs in this outer segment are basically infoldings of the plasma membrane. The plasma membrane folds in and stacks on top of itself. Uh, whereas in rods, they're genuine independent discs, little uh, vesicles that are squashed down and stacked up like cookies. Um, and they form a, an elongated cylinder. Both uh, the rods and the cones embed these outer segments into these, uh, these pigmented epithelial cells uh, that are, are interacting with the rods and cones. So the cones can, uh, portions of them can pinch off and be phagocytized by the pigmented pigmented epithelium uh, as necessary. <clears throat> All right. Within the membrane of either the discs in the cones or the rods, uh, we have a, a lipid bilayer, right? And here, here's a picture of that, this lipid bilayer. There is a transmembrane protein in this lipid bilayer called retinal. <clears throat> in fact, uh, I, I'm, pardon me, the, the Protein is called rhodopsin, uh, and rhodopsin is made up of a molecule called retinal and then the opsin protein. So the protein without retinal is just called opsin. With retinal uh, on it, it's called rhodopsin, and embeds itself in the membrane. Uh, retinal is, um, is derived from vitamin A. Talk about that in a minute. So this is how this is 
the mechanics, the, the biochemistry of how uh, vision works. All right? So uh, in the resting state, that is in the darkness, a cone is going to have um, a negative 40 millivolt resting potential. And at this potential, uh, the sodium channels are actually open. They're open. Because remember, uh, in other neurons, that threshold is at minus 60. Minus 70, it's closed. Minus 60, it's open. We're at minus 40. That sodium channel is open. Um, and sodium is flooding in. Sodium comes in and then is continued to be pumped out by uh, a sodium ATPase down in the inner portion of the cell. This is called the dark current. Because that cell membrane is depolarized in the dark, it's depolarized, we are getting neurotransmitter release. This neuron is firing. This neuron is firing. It's dark but the neuron is firing, all right? This is the resting dark current of a cell before light comes. The neuron is firing, and your brain is going to interpret that as darkness. Step one, photoreception. Let there be light. Photon comes in, hits the 11 cis retinal. So, uh, and then converts it to 11 trans right now. How many of you have had organic chemistry? I asked you that earlier in the semester. A few of you have. Yeah. For those that have not, <clears throat> when you have a carbon chain, like so, if these are all single bonds, if they're single bonds, they're freely rotatable about all these bonds, okay? You can just rotate it. This can turn and squiggle any way it wants. If, however, one of them is a double bond, there is no rotation. There's no rotation about that bond, okay? So, uh, this double bond can either be cis or trans. Trans has the other branches coming off on opposite sides of that double bond. Okay? And cis would have them be on the same side of the double bond. So, for example, I'm, I'm, I'm torturing you today. So, we're a double bond, and our legs are the two branches. We are currently cis. And our direction. legs, what's that? On the same direction. Yeah, they're pointing in the same direction. And our legs can kick into one another like this. If I wanted to get away from your legs, sorry, I'm kicking you. I, I couldn't really do that very easily, right? But um, I could stand on my head on his book here, hold both of his hands, sending my legs up this way, his legs are down this way, and our feet would be totally free to kick around and have all the room they would want. Low uh, energy in terms of keeping the legs away. But that's a pretty unstable situation, isn't it? Me standing on my head, right? Uh, actually, it's, it's the cis that's the unstable situation. Uh, having the, the, the feet near one another is high energy. That's unstable. It doesn't take a lot to switch, those, uh, to switch uh, that bond around. So we hit this double bond with some uh, UV light that's just at the right wavelength. It absorbs that UV light. The double that enables uh, the pi electrons that are forming that double bond to reorient, and suddenly it become, goes to the lower energy uh, trans right now. So if I look at the energy diagram of that double bond, uh, we have we have up here uh, the cis, and here's the trans. All right. So, and this is this is energy, right? This is the energy diagram. 
So this is uh, the energy that is uh, the free that is due to the frequency of light, the energy of the light that uh, that double bond is going to absorb. It absorbs that light, it pushes it over the hill, and then it goes down to the lower energy trans structure. Okay. Okay. So we convert 11 cis to 11 trans. That should make sense to everybody. Hey. Okay? Soon as that happens, we get this whole cascade of transducin, uh, uh, rhodopsin affects, uh, activates transducin, which affects uh, another protein called phosphodiesterase. Phosphodiesterase uh, cleaves the phosphodiester bond that's causing uh, GMP to be cyclic. GMP, it cleaves that phosphodiester bond, uh, just turning the GMP into CGMP into GMP, and then all of the CGMP that is keeping that door open uh, diffuses off of that, that channel. The door swings shut, and sodium cannot pour into the uh, cell any longer. Okay? So we have short-circuited the dark current. As soon as that happens, we go from minus 40 back up to minus 70, because this sodium pump is still on, pumping sodium out. And we get back to uh, what should be our resting potential in a normal neuron, right? So as soon as that happens, this, uh, this, these neurotransmitters that are being released at the synapse stop, and as soon as that happens, this bipolar cell, which has been inhibited by these neurotransmitters, this is an inhibitory synapse, are suddenly released. Bam. Okay? Follow? It sends a signal to the brain. Now, these synapses are really complicated. There's everybody sticking their nose in at that synapse. Those uh, horizontal cells are getting in there, uh, modifying that. There are um, different types of on and off uh, phase bipolar cells. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, it, it's the, the mechanics of this, of just that the synaptic photoreception are, we're just barely beginning to iron out all the details. There's still some unanswered questions as to exactly what's happening, how it's mediated, uh, but, they're, but they're getting a, a <clears throat> more detailed understanding for sure uh, than they had even 10 years ago. Um, but this is, this is a sort of simple cartoon version we're going to uh, have for the moment. So, <clears throat> what happens after uh, stimulation? So we have, um, let's start at the top of that cycle there. We have rhodopsin, gets hit by a photon, uh, isomerized from the 11 cis to the 11 trans right now. Uh, and we have the photo cascade that happens. As soon as that happens, that, that conformational shift to 11 trans kicks the, tran the retinal off. It, it dissociates from uh, the rhodopsin, leaving opsin, um, and then there is an enzyme that has to, an ATPase, that uh, uses the energy of ATP to put that 11 trans back into the high energy 11 cis, which uh, associates back with the opsin and regenerates the rhodopsin for another cycle. That is called bleaching. It's bleaching, photo bleaching. So like, as I stand here and look at you, it's kind of hard to block out that projector. So as I, I, I'm looking at Brittany or Alex, and this little part in my retina is getting photo bleached. When I close my eyes, there's this part, uh, this little the shadow, the ghost of uh, the bright light that I was looking at. That, that opsin has been fully bleached by all of the uh, light that has struck those cones there. It takes a minute to regenerate. Uh, the uh, the rhodopsin. All right. So scotopic or dark vision. Um, <clears throat> in the darkness, 
the bulk of your retinal pigments are photoreceptive. That's the uh, rods and the cones. And when there's bright light, uh, we get extensive photobleaching of the retinal pigments, meaning that uh, the bright light, it, it, since it's hitting so many rhodopsin molecules, it's kicking off all of that retinal, and suddenly the eyes, there's not much functional rhodopsin any longer. Okay, so in very bright light, there's only a, there's a smaller percentage of the uh, the rods or cones that are actually viable. Night blindness, by and large, not always, but the majority of night blindness is due to a vitamin A deficiency. Um, so maybe you're not getting enough of a dietary source. Uh, the, the best source of uh, vitamin A is in beta carotene because for every molecule of beta carotene, it's a two for one deal. You're getting, uh, you just cleave it right here you snip it off, and you're going to hydrolyze it, basically. Just put uh, water across that double bond, and uh, you're going to get yourself uh, two retinols, which then can be uh, oxidized into retinol. Uh, so, okay. The dual vision system. A single receptor type, right, be it a rod or a cone, uh, is not able to produce both high sensitivity, high light sensitivity, and high resolution. Okay? So either you can see well in the dark, in low light, or you can have high, highly resolved, like high definition sight. Um, and since you can have either or, Let's just have our cake and eat it too. Let's get two different visual systems, one that gives us each. So now we are able to see in low light, and when we're in bright light, uh, we can have high visual acuity. So it's so high resolution. Not acuity, pardon me. Um, so <clears throat> these two systems are called the scotopic system, meaning uh, in the dark, and the photopic system, meaning uh, in the light. All right. The scotopic system is highly sensitive, highly sensitive. So I told you the rods, uh, the rods are more sensitive to light anyways. In fact, it only takes a single photon to set a rod off. A single photon is enough to get the ball rolling in a rod. Um, more than that, there is this convergent wiring, this convergent wiring where we have uh, many, many, many rods that represent, for example, one square millimeter of retina uh, that go to these bipolar cells. A bipolar cell is monitoring many of the rods uh, that converge down to one of these M-type or magno ganglion cells. M stands for magno or big. It's a ganglion cell that's monitoring a large number of these rods. Um, this is kind of, in fact, it's not kind of, it, it, it is an example of receptive field that we talked about, what was that, yesterday? Where uh, large receptive fields on your back um, are giving, not giving you highly resolved, uh, not high resolution, uh, but it is giving you a high sensitivity here to light. It's telling you if there's light anywhere in this area that's hitting you, all right? So low light, low light, high sensitivity, but low resolution, scotopic system. All right. This helps you uh, detect motion. This helps detect shadows and dim light. Uh, and then there's the photopic system, where one cone synapses on one pi uh, bipolar cell, which synapses on one ganglion cell, uh, these P-type ganglion cells, parvo for small, all right? So this is covering two micrometers, two uh, square micrometers, much, much smaller, much smaller uh, surface area in the retina, okay? So it's going to take a lot more light hitting, uh, <clears throat> hitting the back of the retina to turn on an, any given... Uh, 
any given cone there. But you have much more high resolution sight, much more high definition sight. Okay? So edges, fine detail, and this is also where we get color from. Uh, you know, there's, there's a lot that could be made about, um, there's a lot that could be made about uh, visual process, central visual processing. So visual processing in the occipital cortex up here. Certainly, you know, there's a lot going on back there. But there's a huge amount of information sorting right in the retina. Right in the retina. Uh, there's a lot of, of information processing that happens there. So, uh, and here are two of the, the processes. There's the process of retinal convergence. So we'll have, I've already mentioned this the last slide, you can have 130 million photoreceptors that are all synapsing on only 6 million bipolar cells, which are uh, synapsing on 1 million ganglion cells. All right, so two orders of magnitude of convergence there, just across two synapses. Um, there's also horizontal integration horizontal integration, and this is uh, monitored and mediated, this is probably the right word, by horizontal cells and amacrine cells. These are the cells at the junctions of the neuro, uh, uh, of the um, sensory receptors, the rods and cones, and the bipolar cells, or the bipolar cells, and the ganglion cells for the amacrine. So what does that mean? That means that not only is there convergence, like so vertical integration, there means that at any given step in this process, a bunch of the cells uh, over here are communicating and affecting the way the cells in an adjacent bundle are going to be functioning. All right? So it's as if uh, I gave everybody in the classroom a little piece of paper that had a color on it. All right? And uh, the way you guys are spatially arranged, that those colors that you have makes a picture of some sort. Okay, and um, if I were to ask Jack what the picture is, he looks at his card and he says, "Oh, it's, it's red. My card is red. I don't know. Am I looking at an apple? Jeez, Louise, what what is the picture, Jack? Your your number's red. Your color's red. Hell, I have. What's that?" An apple, sure, okay. I gave you that one. Um, and then I ask Brittany what her color is, and she says white. So what's the picture, Brittany? Still don't really know. But now if you were able to ask Alex what his color is and Jack what his color is, and Eliza and all the people around you, you'd find out that we have red, red, white, 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 red, red. Okay. You still might not know, but you would have a better idea. You might guess that it's what? The American flag or something like that, right? So that's part of how this information is getting processed horizontally. Like neighbors, nearest neighbors are sharing information as it's progressing uh, vertically towards the uh, the central nervous system. Uh, it gets it gets more sophisticated here. So within the turf that any single uh, ganglion cell is going to monitor, there are cones that are on center that are in the middle of that receptive field versus ones that are on the outside of that receptive field, and that's going to have an impact uh, on on uh, visual uh, reception as well, and information process. So what this does is it helps us by discriminating edges. Within, if an edge is falling uh, in light, if, uh, if there's an edge falling across the middle of a particular region, uh, receptive field that a single ganglion cell is monitoring, um, having a different response to the on-center versus off-center is going to help uh, provide that information of, um, of edge discrimination. The ganglion cell may say, well, 
something's going on here. I must be near an edge, right? This must be some sort of edge. Uh, I'm not going to go into all this in detail, uh, but if, if you're interested, you can look at, at, at the specifics of how that works. All right. Uh, then once all that information passes out of the retina, it goes along with uh, the retinal artery down um, the optic nerve uh, to the brain. All right. Depth perception. How? So I was just reading this article yesterday about how they put 3D glasses on a praying mantis and showed a praying mantis uh, 3D movies and were able to determine, uh, were able to, to study depth perception, stereopsis is what it's called, uh, in, um, in actually, they're not even chordates in insects, in arthropods. Uh, they're trying to study the, the origin of 3D vision, and, and they've determined that humans are not the only creatures that can uh, go to see Star Wars in 3D. Um, so, yeah. Anyways, uh, how does that work? Well, it's basically triangulation. Because we have binocular vision. People who have one eye injured um, do not have depth perception. They see uh, things in a... In a two-dimensional flat surface, uh, whereas when you have both eyes open, your, your brain is able to look at uh, slight uh, differences in the picture from this eye versus the picture from this eye as it's separated and uh, tell the, di you know, it processes or calculates the, the, that difference between one side and the other for Alex versus Jack and there are slight differences in those differences, and it, it says, okay, the difference in those differences tells me that Alex is that much further away uh, than, than Jack. That's where our depth perception comes from. That, uh, so, is due to binocular vision and then all of the central processing uh, that happens uh, in the brain through the superior colliculus, uh, down in the... In the, uh, the geneticulate nuclei and the various uh, nuclei in the brain stem and, and the thalamus. And then we have the radiations that go back into the visual cortex uh, where uh, there is a, a map of your visual field in sort of the same homunculus kind of way that your body is mapped in the primary somatosensory or motor cortex, cortices. Uh, there, there is this map of your visual field back in the, uh, in the occipital lobe. All right. So um, we see in color, I mentioned that, uh, it's due to the fact that there are different uh, sensitivities to various frequencies of light by um, the cones in our eye. And there are three types of cones. There are blue cones, red cones, and green cones. So just because we call it a red cone doesn't mean that it only sees red. In fact, if you look at a red cone, it can see all the way down into the blue spectrum, but its peak is, a, is in the orange, and it's, it's the only one that can see red. So if you don't have a red cone, you don't see red. You, the best you can do is see kind of orange, as uh, dictated by the, the green peak cones. Um, so red, green, and blue are the three types of cones. And that's basically because there are slight tweaks in the structure of the opsin protein that are being expressed through those uh, three different cones that are going to slightly modify the frequency of light that that uh, retinal is going to absorb, that double bond uh, in the, the 11 cis double bond in the retinal will absorb. Okay. All right, so uh, is there anyone colorblind in, in the room? Um, well, anybody who is colorblind would see nothing here. They would just see a bunch of dots. Uh, they wouldn't see the number 12. Hopefully, you all see a red 12. Um, but there are color deficiencies as well. So people who have maybe one cone completely gone or fewer of one type of cone or another than, uh, than an average individual may have. Um, 
in these three circles in the bottom, this is the Ishihara test named after a Japanese uh, ophthalmologist that first described this. So uh, does everybody see the numbers down there? Does anybody not see 64225? You don't. Oh, it's a crap projector. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I'll go down to the office today and tell them that we need some new bulbs. They drag the feet. They're expensive, I guess. Well, anyways, uh, here is the rainbow flag of a, a normal uh, vision. Uh, protonopia, no red cones, is what a rainbow flag would look like next to it if you have no green cones or no blue cones. Uh, and, th and there are other types. Uh, you can have no bl blue or uh, green. Turns out that men are slightly uh, blue-green color deficient, um, just as a, as a general population. Uh, there's, there's some uh, sex-linked chromosome uh, aspect to blue-green color deficiency that, uh, on the Y chromosome that um, aff affects men. A little bit. It's 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 minor, but all right. A any questions on the eye? I kind of went too slow on the eye. I like the eye. Uh, I got a little bit of time to hit the ear. We're gonna skip the anatomy, uh, the anatomy quiz. And we'll just jump right into it. The external ear, uh, the external auditory meatus uh, has these ceruminous glands. Uh, these are glands, epithelial glands that uh, peruse produce cerumen, earwax. Um, so knowing ear, middle ear pathology and how that can be visualized uh, by looking into the ear with an otoscope uh, can, can be very useful. So on the left is a normal eardrum. Uh, there's an acute infection, so we see that eardrum backed by a bunch of pus. Uh, there's a bunch of ear fluid, uh, snot basically in the middle panel, uh, perforated eardrum. This is somebody who jammed something into their eardrum, uh, messed it up. And then finally, the last one is an ear tube. This sometimes happens to people who uh, have chronic middle ear infection uh, and they need uh, that opened because they can't normalize the pressure across it. So. Um, any odorologist will tell you to actually not stick Q-tips in your ear. It may be fun. It may be kind of interesting to pull out all the sweet potatoes in there. Uh, but <clears throat> it's, it's, most odorologists don't want you to do that. If you have a problem with dry earwax that accumulates, uh, then they will ask you to just put a drop or two of mineral oil in your ear. Um, and uh, that mineral oil will help uh, loosen up the earwax. Just the process of moving your jaw, talking, chewing, uh, naturally moves the earwax uh, forward and out of the ear. It, it should uh, just fall out of your ear in small, invisible flakes. Um, but if you have an accumulation of earwax, use mineral oil. Don't stick things in your ear. People get too zealous and then, ouch. Uh, the middle ear, the tympanic cavity. So here is a picture, a pretty sweet picture, of the middle ear via the auditory tube. So the eustachian tube, somebody went in with a camera through the mile hawker in there and stuck a tube up, uh, the, uh, a little camera up the uh, auditory tube into the middle ear, and then they must have stuck a light in the external uh, auditory meatus, which is what you're seeing there um, on, the, on the far side of the tympanic membrane. Cool picture. Uh, otitis media is a chronic middle ear infection that happens in a lot of kids because uh, the morphology um, the, of their skull uh, puts that uh, eustachian tube more horizontal than it would be in an adult. And sometimes when they have infection, the middle ear doesn't clear uh, properly in young kids. So uh, did anybody here ever have those middle ear tubes stuck in? Some, some kids, because it doesn't drain, they'll just stick a tube and it just keeps the, the uh, auditory tube open the whole time. All right. Hearing. 
So I'm going to assume you guys have that anatomy because I'm running out of time. I don't want to redo what we did in lab. Um, the primary organ of hearing is the cochlea. And uh, here is the spiral organ. We have the outer hair cells and the inner hair cells embedded uh, in that spiral organ with the tectorial membrane above them, uh, all within the cochlear duct. There's uh, the scala vestibuli, or here labeled as vestibular duct, and the tympanic duct, or uh, scala tym and tympani, uh, below it. Um, that's just the anatomy. So let's get a little, a real picture of what these hair cells, uh, the, which are the auditory receptors of uh, the cochlea, look like. So that's pretty cool. Uh, we see three rows of the outer hair cells and then another row of the inner hair cells uh, right there. So uh, in the top panel is uh, a depiction of healthy hair cells. However, if um, you were uh, more into Lemmy and Motorhead, uh, God rest his soul, then maybe your ears would look like these damaged ones. Your hair cells would look at like these damaged ones in the bottom panel. We see uh, ex chronic exposure to extreme noise uh, can uh, damage the outer hair cells, leading to uh, tinnitus and eventually, potentially, uh, a permanent loss of hearing, permanent hearing loss. So uh, I've definitely hurt my ears over my lifetime a little bit. Uh, and uh, it's, it's real, it's, a, it's not fun. Make sure uh, to protect your ears. Um, all right, so how does this actually work? <coughs> Some kind of sound happens uh, by something vibrating in and around you, okay? So um, that vibration causes pressure waves in the air. Uh, places where the air gets pushed together a little bit and places where it's a little bit thinner. Um, like, has anybody ever put their hands in front of a really big bass speaker when it's going like that? You can feel the vibration of the air right in front of it. That is those pressure waves. Um, another sort of way of thinking about that is uh, there's no sound in a vacuum. Nobody hears you scream in outer space uh, because there's nothing to vibrate there, all right? That would be if you were planning to be in outer space without your space suit on. Um, the distance between these waves, uh, these pressure waves in the air, uh, is the wavelength of the sound that we're going to be experiencing. Those pressure waves go into the outer ear and, and impinge upon the tympanic membrane. So. Uh, this is a way of depicting the sound energy in that bottom thing. The wavelength is going to be uh, inversely related to the frequency, so the pitch of the sound. Is it down here or is it up here? Wherever it is. And the amplitude uh, is a way of depicting the intensity of the sound. Is it uh, this loud or is it this loud? Uh, that is going to be reflected in the amplitude. All right, so here is uh, hearing step by step. Step one, sound arrives at uh, the tympanic membrane, uh, vibrates the membrane like the head of a drum, and that vibration is picked up by the, the three bones, the malleus, the incus, and the stapes, and they transfer uh, that, the, those auditory ossicles transfer, transfer that vibration to uh, the, round, the oval window, pardon me, of the um, vestibule in the <coughs> inner ear, um, that vibration then uh, cr causes pressure waves in the paralymph of uh, the inner ear. So there is uh, this bony labyrinth. Inside of it, there's this membranous labyrinth. Uh, and there's perilymph in the bony labyrinth, and then that membranous labyrinth inside of it is full of endolymph. Um, so the vibration passes up 
through the uh, vestibular duct or scala vestibuli, vibrates part of that basilar membrane in the spiral organ, and then the pressure waves come down the other end of the tympanic duct. All right. So pressure waves distort the basilar membrane, stimulating the hair cells there, and then uh, the vibration is dissipated out through uh, the round window. That information is then, the stimulated hair cells send information to the brain via the cochlear nerve, which is a branch of eight. So um, here is the tube of the cochlea unwrapped unwrapped. So we've sort of unspiral wrapped it and stretched it out uh, so that we have the stapes at the oval window is going to uh, vibrate back and forth and it's going to push the fluid, it's going to compress the fluid of uh, the vestibular duct which um, is going to push in at the basilar membrane of the uh, cochlear duct, thus stimulating the hair cells there. And then the stapes is going to move out because it's, it's vibrating like this. Uh, and so that basilar membrane is going to begin to vibrate up and down. Where on that basilar membrane it vibrates is dependent upon the frequency of oscillation of that stapes in the oval window. Uh, when the stapes moves out, the round window moves in. When the, uh, when the round window moves in, the uh, when the stapes moves in, the round window moves out. So there's this sort of back and forth uh, vibration between the two and, and a sympathetic uh, vibration in the basilar membrane at a specific uh, frequency. So um, we can see they have mapped here the frequency range that the membrane is uh, susceptible to, going from 16,000 uh, hertz down to 1,000 hertz. Right. So how do these hair cells actually work? Um, uh, here we have uh, these hairs sticking up out of the hair cell. We have the mechanically gated channels with a lid on it, and there is just a little, so these hairs are actually called stereocilia, uh, and there are these linking proteins that uh, connect to the top of them. When you tip this stack of hairs over, uh, the, the little uh, connecting proteins rip the door open and allow potassium to flood into the cell thus uh, depolarizing uh, that cell. The cochlea itself has a uh, this labeled line code along the length of that basilar membrane uh, where high frequency sounds are at the beginning of the coil and low frequency sounds are at the top of the coil. That uh, then sends the, the first order neurons uh, into the brain stem where we're going to have a synapse uh, and then uh, that's going to send second order neurons up to the thalamus, uh, near the thalamus, uh, or in the thalamus in the medial geniculate uh, nuclei where there's a synapse and finally the third order neuron for us to be consciously aware of the sound is going to project up into the temporal lobe where once again there is a mapping uh, sort of like this homunculus, there's a, a frequency map this time. It's instead of it being like somatosensory spatial map of your body or the map of the visual uh, field in the occipital lobe, there is a, a map on your temporal lobe of sound. So there, you can say right here, uh, this uh, neuron is where you know 240. Uh, kilohertz is, you know, or four, four kilohertz is this, uh, this neuron right there. And next to it is five kilohertz and six kilohertz, whatever. So there's this frequency mapping in the temporal lobe. All right. Hearing, so, you know, I'm fairly partial to uh, sight because it is so mysterious, uh, even still. Um, it's, it's, it's a 
pretty phenomenal thing. Uh, however, sound is also truly unbelievable. Uh, if in no other reason, for no other reason than this right here, without a doubt, the um, power range of sensitivity of uh, of the ear is is astounding. So there is a trillion-fold power range in the types of sounds that you can reasonably uh, experience. A trillion-fold power range. Let me put that into uh, another context. Imagine a uh, temperature a thermal receptor. Uh, do you, can you imagine a thermal receptor that is able to uh, reasonably experience a trillion-fold uh, range in temperature. Of course not. That's ludicrous. Uh, or a pressure sensor that's able to sensate a trillion-fold range in pressure. Um, how about uh, a, a photoreceptor that can reasonably sensate and give you the discrimination between a trillion-fold intensity of light? None of these things uh, are even remotely possible. The fact that your ear can sensate a trillion-fold difference in the power of the sound. That, and when I say that, I mean the intensity of the sound, like the quietest, quietest whisper that you can actually uh, hear versus the loudest sound uh, that you can hear before you actually lose your hearing. Um, that is, it's phenomenal. It's, it's phenomenal. So uh, here's the, uh, because it is such a large dynamic range of intensity, uh, we use a logarithmic scale. It's not a linear scale. We use a logarithmic scale to measure sound intensity. So something um, that is uh, 30 decibels, which is a quiet uh, library, is... Uh, in order of magnitude quieter than a, in a quiet office, all right, so, and so forth. Uh, anything above 70 or 80 decibels is uh, dangerous to be chronically exposed to. Uh, yeah, and so you can look at that sometime and begin to be aware of the way you treat your ears. Uh, the, the world we live in now is certainly a far noisier, a far more chronically noisy place uh, than uh, humans who came before us who evolved our sense of hearing had to find themselves in. Um, so modern humans are much, much more prone to hearing damage uh, than were our ancestors. All right. Um, so on to the vestibular system. I've got just about 10 minutes to talk about this. Um, there's the bony labyrinth of the inner ear. And then uh, inside that, there is sort of a mirror, like a, a, an exact model of that bony labyrinth, but made out of a membrane. Uh, and this is called the membranous labyrinth um, that's nestled inside the bony labyrinth. Uh, and when we look at it here, this would be the bony labyrinth. Uh, right, and so this dark blue line is the membranous labyrinth. Inside the membranous lab labyrinth is the endolymph. Endolymph, uh, it's fluid. And then uh, between the membranous labyrinth and the bony uh, labyrinth, there's what's called perilymph. So there's, there's, it's just these, this fluid, uh, these fluid compartments inside the ear. All right, hair cells. So we've already sort of talked about hair cells uh, in the cochlea. The inner ear just takes this same motif and runs with it, uh, comes up with different ways of using these same structures. So here is a, a scanning electron micrograph uh, that's been colorized of some uh, stereocilia or hair cells uh, in... Um, the other port in the vestibular portion of uh, the inner ear. These hair cells are the, the fundamental receptors uh, of the inner ear, and they're going to give us information uh, 
about the direction and intensity of some kind of mechanical stimuli uh, that will then be interpreted in various ways by the brain. All right, that can be interpreted as giving us information uh, about our orientation or our acceleration uh, or uh, whether we're um, moving in circles or what have you. Okay. All that information is going to be important for establishing balance and orientation and proprioception and, and feeding back into, into proprioceptive information from the rest of the body. So, um, yeah, let's go over some of this anatomy just to, just to make sure you guys are oriented. Uh, we have the semicircular ducts with the ampulla and uh, these cupula which are, have the crista ampullaris and the hair cells embedded in them. So each of the semicircular ducts has its own ampulla. And then there, so there's that, those three, which are one unit. It's one thing we're going to talk about. And then the second thing is going to be uh, the saccule and the utricle with their attended macule, uh, maculae, or singular macula. So we'll talk about both of those. Uh, in, right now. First, the semicircular ducts and the crista ampullaris. So in that ampule, it, uh, right in that, sort of, okay. By the way, the word ampule, uh, does anybody know what that is? So it used to be uh, that medicine came uh, in these little, that was a bad drawing, these, these vials that were like this, you know, a small little vial. And then this was glass, and you crack that, and then pour the medicine out, whatever it was, right? So, ampule. so this structure here is uh, what gives it its name, ampule. Uh, so the ampulla, uh, and you can see why it may be called that. It's, it's what it sort of looks like. Um, uh, the cupula is this jelly-like matrix that a really dense jelly or gel gelatinous jello-like matrix that has um, the hair cells with their stereocilia embedded up into that matrix, okay? And uh, we have that duct. You'll notice um, what's interesting about it is, that is a bad picture, but when you go in the lab, you can see it. Uh, these three semicircular ducts are each lying in the three-dimensional planes, right? So one is horizontal, one is vertical, uh, and the other is in the other vertical plane, right? So th those three uh, ducts oops, are uh, sampling the three spatial dimensions that we live in. Um, and when you're moving through one of those planes, when your body is accelerating through one of those planes, like this, or uh, what would the other one be? Maybe like this. Um, when you're moving through one of those planes, you are sloshing the, the uh, endolymph that's in that membranous labyrinth through that, that tube. And that fluid is going to push on the cupula, tipping the cupula over, and with it knocking uh, the stereocilia just to the side, just a little bit, just enough for the, so the potassium channels to open up and depolarize that cell and send a signal to the brain. So it can tell you uh, the direction of the duct rotation as well, depending on which way um, it's, it's tipping. Um, here is a picture of these hair cells. <clears throat> um, the way this works is uh, there is the stereocilia, and then there's one special stereocilium uh, called the kinocilium. So if the stereocilia bend towards the kinocilium, it depolarizes the cell and depolarizes the cell and stimulates the sensory neuron. And if it, they bend in the opposite direction, so if we have uh, opening of the channels in the stereocilia but not the kinocilium. Uh, then it inhibits the sensory neuron. So this um, is not just an on-off. This is an on A or B switch. Okay, it's like a three-pole switch or double-throw switch. Does that make sense? Did I do that too fast? Um, so 
Next is the saccule and the utricle. So the semicircular canals are giving us information about motion through space, through the three dimensions of space, like this. Okay. The satricle, uh, saccule and utricle are giving us information about um, acceleration. So um, we have this, these macula that are embedded. Uh, it's, it's, again, a big gelatinous patch with uh, the hair cells embedded in them. And then on top of it are these otoliths. Oto meaning ear, lith meaning stone. Uh, it's just these calcium carbonate crystals that are shown in the picture there. Um, my mother-in-law's mother, my grandmother-in-law, makes this thing called 7-Up Salad. It is lime jello made with 7-Up, and uh, on top of it, so it's, it's lime jello with 7-Up uh, sprinkled with... Oh, no, with bananas embedded and sprinkled with shredded cheese. This is what passes for fancy in the Midwest. Um, but the thing about this, this stuff, it's pretty fascinating uh, because, you know, she'll show up at the party with her 7-Up salad, and then there'll be, you know, the neighbors kind of jealously eyeing the 7-Up salad with their whatever, their jello mold, and their jello mold is, is just kind of like shaking a little bit. And, and, uh, and J Grandma Jan's is like doing this because it's got all of that, the bananas and shredded cheddar up there. Um, it's sort of like this. I'm all, it makes me think of this because the <laughs> otoliths are this mass on top of this gelatinous thing that are enabling... Uh, that are accentuating or, or amplifying, is the right word, amplifying the vibrations in the gelatinous uh, macula. All right, so it's kind of like Grandma Jan, the vibrations in Grandma Jan's 7-Up salad. <laughs> um, okay, so, uh, and this is going to give us information about uh, orientation. So, again, just information about uh, equilibrium and, and orientation. So if your head is tilted back, the cheese is sort of sliding off the 7-Up salad back that way. The otoliths are dragging the, the, uh, the macula backwards or uh, vice versa in the other direction. All right. Um, and then we're, we're close. So uh, the same vestibular projection pathways uh, that we had um, in any sensory neuron. So the, the, the first order neurons come out of uh, the vestibular cochlear nerve or the vestibular branch of the vestibular cochlear nerve. Uh, they are going to synapse somewhere in the brain stem, in the pons, in fact. Uh, and then second order neurons are going to ascend from the pons up to the thalamus uh, uh, where they're going to synapse. And then for us to be aware of our balance, uh, the third order neurons, after synapsing in the thalamus, uh, are going to go up and uh, relay into the uh, vestibular cortex. So this is the mapping in the cortex uh, mapping of our sense of awareness. So there are there's a map there that is uh, related to your sense, your spatial sense of orientation. Um, so, all right, the last bit is. Pathology. Let's skip the pathology. It doesn't matter. We're, I'm, I'm just over time. So recap. Uh, ocular anatomy. I started off by quizzing you on the, the ocular anatomy. Then uh, I went through the basics, the basic physics of optics. Uh, we talked about photoreception uh, and how the retina processes uh, information, and I briefly touched on the visual pathways. Uh, and then I went to the ear, and we talked about the anatomy and the, and the function of first the cochlea and hearing and those pro uh, projection pathways, and then the vestibular system that gives us balance, orientation, and our sense of motion. Okay. Uh, are there any questions?